to the tech Pearl Harbor by air. Ask not what your country can do. Kennedy has been shot. One small step for man is to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. At the lunch counter in this Greensboro, North Carolina Woolworths, in February of 1960, four college freshmen took a stand by simply sitting down. The day that we, we decided to sit down, we figured we could go to jail. If that was what we faced, then, then it was worth doing that. By asking for a cup of coffee and a donut, Joe McNeil and his friends had taken on segregation, an established way of life in the American South, one which would not allow blacks to eat with whites at a lunch counter or use the same restrooms or drink from the same water fountains. There comes a time in life where you say, hey, we're going to confront it and see where it goes. Within weeks of the Greensboro sit-in, similar protests were breaking out in more than 30 southern cities. There was a astounding, rapid ripple effect because every time you turned on the radio or TV, there was another sit-in someplace. And all of the people sitting in were young. We had crossed the line. I was no longer afraid of being arrested than afraid to go to jail. The first time I got arrested, I tell you, I was free. I was liberated. Young people getting arrested on purpose so they could be free. They touched the conscience of America. As we began to see what was coming out of the South, we knew that there was something wrong in this country. And I think that that had a powerful effect on us. The effect was to believe that it was possible to make change in the world and that you had a responsibility to take part in that change. In the early 1960s, young people came to the forefront in America. The civil rights movement was often driven by their anger. The culture of the era was certainly shaped by their tastes and desires. The country would elect its youngest president at the beginning of the decade. His energy and enthusiasm seemed to promise a revitalized nation, a country spirited and strong enough to meet the challenges at home and in an increasingly dangerous world, the challenges abroad. The Cold War's shadow continued to hang like a dark cloud over an otherwise optimistic horizon. The presidential candidates in 1960, Massachusetts Senator John Kennedy and Vice President Richard Nixon were only in their mid-40s. Both were ardent cold warriors. But I am not satisfied as an American to be second to the Soviet Union. What we want to do is to not to turn their way, but to do it our way. And that's exactly what we're talking about in this campaign. The country had a consensus at that time. There, was, there were no real divisions. Uh, among the majority of Americans over the Cold War and communism. And Nixon and Kennedy emphasized their anti-communist credentials, which were uh, sterling on both sides. Both men were Navy veterans. The candidates had been freshman congressmen together after the war. But somehow Kennedy seemed the younger and identified himself as the candidate of a new generation. His enthusiasm, his energy and determination was infectious and we all felt and the country felt that yes, you know, we're on the march again and then it was a good march. You know, we went 
to several states to, to campaign. I was in my early 20s. Um, I walked the precinct in Redondo Beach. I don't think I've ever done that before or since. Um, he affected everybody. The favorite candidate of much of the entertainment community reached the high point of his campaign in a series of debates on television. These were the first presidential debates ever, ever. There had never been a presidential debate before. Smith, Senator Kennedy. And the fact that it was happening live and on television gave it a kind of theater that was remarkable. The question now is, can freedom be maintained? The candidates were close on the issues, particularly on a tough stand against the Soviet Union. I, of course, disagree with Senator Kennedy. Studies after the debate show that those who heard it on the radio thought Mr. Nixon had won. Those who saw it on television gave the edge to Kennedy. The image that came controls. over definitely favored Kennedy. Surplus, which breaks the price to see his earnestness, his, to feel his charm, to feel his idealism, uh, I, I, I'm convinced that he would not have won without the debates. After the closest presidential election of the century, the country's oldest elected president at the time was succeeded by its youngest. I remember watching the inaugural with pleasure and even a kind of pride. I was struck by the fact that he didn't wear an overcoat, though it was a very cold January day. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. It was very exhilarating in a sense to have a man as young and articulate and electric as John Kennedy was. Uh, what he said was quite hawkish when you look back on that it. That we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. liberty. After the soaring words of the inaugural speech, the inaugural parties gave final proof to the notion that a younger and more glamorous administration had arrived. I remember Lenny Bruce saying, isn't it great to have a president who you can imagine sleeping with his wife? Um, and I thought at the time, God, I, I, I think that too. You could identify with a man in, in that sense. And yet, uh, it was the first president that seemed like a guy not like something on a dollar bill. The idea of a White House run and staffed by younger people with a 32-year-old chief speechwriter and a press secretary in his 30s and all these people around Kennedy, th there was that feeling that well, if they're running the political system, surely we can be somehow involved in it. We wanted to serve. We wanted to do something because young people, me included, uh, in those days, did wonder how we were ever going to top the generation before us. Our fathers had fought World War II. They had won. They had beaten a depression in some way. Uh, what are we going to do? April the 12th, 1961, the Soviet sent cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin into orbit around the globe. The first Sputnik in 57, and then Yuri Gagarin going into space in 61, terrified the American people. People were sitting around and talking about what would we do if the Russians had arms, missiles, whatever, 
on the moon and could shoot it. We were making the stuff up, but shoot it, shoot at us at will. Then we'd have to surrender, you know, we had to choose better red than dead. That's what people were thinking then. In what would become a spiraling series of superpower moves and counter moves, just three weeks after the Soviets manned launch, the U.S. sent astronaut Alan Shepard into space. And President Kennedy promised even greater heights. We choose to go to the moon. A man on the moon walking on the moon? Now, in this decade? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You gotta be kidding. But Kennedy wasn't kidding. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. This bold push into space was also seen as an aggressive manifestation of the Cold War. And so was a Kennedy-supported CIA scheme in April of 1961 to land Cuban exiles in their homeland to ignite an uprising against Fidel Castro. When the mission failed, leaving the exiles stranded at Cuba's Bay of Pigs, America and the president were humiliated. Three months later, as if sensing American weakness, Khrushchev demanded that all Allied forces be removed from Berlin. We cannot and will not permit the communists to drive us out of Berlin, either gradually or by force. Kennedy put the United States pretty close to a war foot. A lot of people like me got draft notices. It looked like we were going to war. For the second time in the century, Americans faced the threat of war over Berlin. But now, both sides had nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. No president ever spoke more frankly to the nation about the real possibility of nuclear war. In the event of an attack, the lives of those families which are not hit in a nuclear blast and fire can still be saved if they can be warned to take shelter and if that shelter is available. We owe that kind of insurance to our families and to our country. Families were advised to build bomb shelters Schools held atomic attack drills. When I was a kid, I was very worried about the bomb. And I used to sit under that desk thinking, now, would the radiation fall on top of the desk and miss me? But what happens when I get out from under the desk? Then will the radiation fall on me? I didn't quite get it, but it didn't seem to be sensible that I was hiding under this desk. And so I had this worry, and everybody talked about this worry about the bomb. This nuclear threat over Berlin was diffused, but the Soviet-American confrontation would continue. In October of 1961, the Soviets began building the Berlin Wall. The wall would become a symbol of the Cold War's brutal reality. The newsreels presented Americans with haunting images of people risking their lives to escape communism. Once a country went communist, uh, it stayed communist. They had secret police and the whole totalitarian structures so that there was no regressing. That the Soviet Union and its allies were formidable global presence seemed very clear to me. An even more direct threat to American security began to unfold on October the 14th, 1962, when American U-2 surveillance planes flying over Cuba made a discovery. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that the Soviets would introduce uh, nuclear-tipped missiles into Cuba uh, targeted on the eastern part of the United States. They never had moved nuclear weapons off the soil of the Soviet Union. We didn't believe they would, they did. It was my father's decision and, and his own idea. It was only one reason to show that we are great power
and we will protect all our allies. And if anybody will try to fight against our allies, that will mean beginning of the Third World War. The Cuban Missile Crisis would last for 13 days that October. The president and his most trusted advisors tried to figure out how to get Khrushchev to remove the missiles from Cuba. As far as the president was concerned, this was a superpower confrontation. It was the Soviets who had put nuclear missiles in Cuba. It was the Soviets who would have to remove them. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. The U.S. military was put on the maximum level of alert, DEFCON 2. The president ordered the Navy to mount a blockade around Cuba. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. For 72 hours, the world watched and waited as Soviet ships approached the quarantine line. They kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming, they kept coming. So there would be these days of incredible tension. Millions of Americans believed uh, that they were about to die. We literally sat and talked about the fact that we were living then out in the wilds of New Jersey uh, and were we far away from New York City to survive. I remember, I remember that really being a terrifying moment. I was at NYU at the time. And the, the professor uh, was sitting there, and he looked up at the, watch, the clock on the wall, and he goes, well, they'll be meeting about now. They're meeting now, so we'll just have to wait. And there was like deep silence. And nothing happened, you know. It was a deep breath. And then the Soviet premier ordered his ships to turn back. In the end, the Soviet leader agreed to withdraw the missiles in return for a U.S. pledge not to invade Cuba. There isn't going to be any learning curve with respect to nuclear weapons. You make a mistake with respect to a decision to use nuclear weapons, you're going to destroy nations. Both Khrushchev and Kennedy realized how close they'd come and they were determined to avoid that in the future. In 1961, the author James Baldwin wrote, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage all the time. It was two worlds, a black world and a white world. As a young child, I remember very well seeing the signs and, and I resented it. If you went to the Dairy Queen, white people would go in and sit down. You got your ice cream at a window. I never rode a bus because I knew I'd have to sit in the back. I uh, didn't go downtown to the movie theaters because I had to have to sit in the Jim Crow gallery. I, I remember on one occasion I tried to go to the county library and we couldn't even go in and check out of a book. That did not change until the Civil Rights Movement. In the early 1960s, young people would take the lead in the battle for racial equality. Federal courts had ruled that segregated waiting areas in bus stations were illegal, but the law was not being enforced. To pressure the Kennedy administration to intervene, activists rode public buses into the Deep South to integrate the facilities. Outside of Anniston, Alabama, the bus carrying the first group of self-proclaimed Freedom Riders was firebombed. By the time the Freedom Ride started, there was a realization that some of us would have to die. 
and that we should not fear death. And we liken this very much to military service, that if you serve your country in the military, you might lose your life. We were serving our country at home. We knew that this was a very dangerous mission, but we felt we had a moral obligation uh, and a mandate to, to make this trip. John Lewis, then a student leader, was a freedom rider on a bus that arrived in Montgomery, Alabama. The very moment we started down the steps, a mob out of nowhere, people by the hundred, came out with baseball bats, stones, chains, and, and started beating us. I was hit in the head with a wooden crate. And I was left lying unconscious in a pool of blood. I thought I was going to die. Many of the young people in the Civil Rights Movement united in an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC is special because we are young. We're 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. Most of us have dropped out of school, so we're no longer students, but we don't have mortgages, we don't have car payments, we don't have families, we don't have husbands and wives and children. So we can do these things. And because we're young, we're also foolish, and we're willing to take risk. We wanted to create a mass movement. We wanted to get hundreds and thousands of people involved. We had been talking about developing a, a nonviolent army that would be prepared to go into a community, be arrested, court arrest, and so forth, break down that fear of jail as a weapon, and also break down the infrastructure of the local area by filling up their jails. All right, let's stop it right here. It was a tactic that SNCC took to Albany, Georgia. Anybody who found the courage to be involved could be involved. In the first weeks of the Albany campaign, more than 500 young people were arrested. Once you get in jail, it's a sobering experience because jail is not like a rally and jail is not like a march. Some people would get into jail, they would clang those doors and they would actually cry. And then there would be people who felt that we're in jail and we need to pray. Then there were teenagers who wanted to do rock and roll or they were talking about their boyfriends. And it was in jail where I began to be asked to sing a lot. And no money to go to bail. Keep your eyes on the prize, oh Lord. Paul and Silas began to shout. Jail door open and they walked out. Keep your eyes on. If you're in the movement, all of the singing is one way of being heard and announcing your presence. You can't sing a song without producing power. And you will often see people singing in the face of police. If I sing, you stand in my sound. In Albany, Georgia, we force the jails open by numbers and they could not stop us from singing and praying. The movement was energized, but the law did not change. The nine-month effort to desegregate Albany, Georgia, failed. The next major campaign was fought on even tougher ground. It was probably the most violent and vicious racist city in the South. There had been 60 bombings of black people's homes in Birmingham in 61 and 62. One target for the movement in Birmingham was to desegregate the schools. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, had promised they would stay white. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Our demonstrations in Birmingham were usually simply marches to the courthouse or to City Hall. And we almost never got more than two blocks from the church, and then we were arrested. <laughs> 
Day after day, hundreds of demonstrators filled the Birmingham jails. Among those arrested was the organizer of the Birmingham campaign, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. By then, he was the acknowledged leader of the entire civil rights movement. My heroes for the second half of the 20th century, Martin Luther King. All of these people are people who accepted the fact that you have to put everything on the line. Because if you don't, you're not going to get anything. Not in America. Because America is not going to change. Only you can change. As part of the campaign, Dr. King enlisted an army of school children, aged 6 to 16. After the first day of demonstrations, nearly a thousand of them had been herded into police vans and sent to jail. The next day, the police changed their tactics. The law enforcement in Birmingham was headed by one Bull Connor. And Bull Connor was an old-fashioned lock them up, throw them in jail, throw away the key, beat them up, put dogs on them, hose them down with fire hoses. Anything he could think of to try to stop this movement by force, he did. I watched the violence in Birmingham on TV. It shocked me to see the dogs being unleashed on people, and it shamed me. This was the front page of every major newspaper in the world. And it told a story that America was ashamed of. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. Trying to raise congressional support for the Kennedy Civil Rights Bill, civil rights leaders called for a march on Washington. On August the 28th, 1963, more than 200,000 people showed up. Once I got there and saw the crowds coming from all over America, black and white, poor people, rich people, show business, politicians, Martin called it a coalition of goodwill or a coalition of conscience that could change the soul of the nation on the race issue. This was bringing a mass meeting into the homes of millions of Americans who were seeing this thing that I had seen over and over and over again in small town churches everywhere, seeing this for the first time and hearing the oratory of America's premier orator, Martin Luther King. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. <laughs> I remember thinking when I saw Martin Luther King that he was going in his dream to bring the nation along, that he was irresistible in his call to mercy and love. I mean, that he was absolutely the most irresistible voice that had ever been heard. Freedom and justice, I have a dream. My poor little children, one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. You know, I was a little young. Uh, I do remember it. And Martin Luther King was a very powerful effect on me, but it wasn't so much that I understood what he was saying, but I knew that he stood for me because I needed somebody to stand for. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last. 
to me that they represented one of the finest hours in American history. In the 1960s, answering the president's call to action, young people had a new way in which to serve, the Peace Corps. The Corps' first director was the president's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver. Messages kept pouring into the White House from people, younger people for the most part, but older people too, saying, yes, I'm ready to serve. I thought joining the Peace Corps was a perfect way to do good in the world. I mean, I thought it was sort of hands across the ocean. Uh, then I was going to go and help the poor people of the world do something better with their lives. Marnie Mueller was sent to Guayaquil, Ecuador. It was somehow giving people the notion that if they got together, they had power to make change. The Peace Corps was also a way to counter the appeal of communism in the developing world. Other young Americans responded to the president's Cold War call more directly. We're being trained to, uh, to be in the military, to do what the military does, to fight if we have to, to defend the country. So, I mean, we all wanted to go. We thought, I mean, this was, this was our, our, uh, our job. On the same day that President Kennedy established the Peace Corps, he provided more funds for an elite group of warriors called the Special Forces. They would become known as the Green Berets. This is another type of warfare, new in its intensity, ancient in its origin, war by guerrillas, subversives, insurgents, assassins. The very first mission for these highly trained soldiers would be in Vietnam in Southeast Asia. When President Kennedy took office, there were a thousand military advisors in South Vietnam sent there to defend against what America believed was communist expansion. It was a policy based on something called the domino theory. In a sense, we saw if Vietnam falls, the dominoes will fall. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia would fall under communist domination, and they would be strengthened across the globe. And it was to prevent that that Kennedy felt he had to make a move to, to strengthen the South Vietnamese government. The South Vietnamese government, run by Ngo Dinh Diem at the time, needed the help. The leader of North Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, wanted the North and South to be reunited. He was supplying guerrillas in South Vietnam who were growing in numbers and aggressiveness. In Vietnam, you had an insurgency, Viet Cong. They are the insurgents. We've become specialists in counting insurgents. Bill Bowles was one of the first special forces sent to train South Vietnamese troops in the fall of 1961. President Kennedy had increased the number of military advisors to more than 3,000. We had trained these, this civilian irregular defense group for maybe a month. And we decided to send them to villages around Da Nang. And we had four Americans out there. And uh, on the way between the villages, they were ambushed by the Viet Cong. And two of my buddies were killed, and uh, two others were missing. I was shocked. Uh, I guess more than anything, it, it brought home the idea, hey, this is not play. This is not a game. This is not a training exercise anymore. This is kill or be killed. By 1963, the situation was deteriorating. On the streets of the South Vietnamese capital, Saigon, President Diem, desperate to maintain control, was cracking down on his political and religious opponents. In protest, Buddhist monks set themselves on fire. For many Americans, these were the first television images they saw of Vietnam. It was a horrible, horrible experience because we, in a sense, we saw Vietnam disintegrating before our eyes, or at least the, the, the structure of the state disintegrating. ZM had lost control of it. 
American policymakers supported a coup to remove Diem, which resulted in his assassination. U.S. complicity in Diem's death and the resulting turmoil in South Vietnam only deepened America's involvement. As I left the air in 63, it was obvious that, uh, that the war was escalating. We had uh, camps and places that you couldn't even say the name. And uh, we had more people getting killed than ever before. America would commit more and more soldiers. It would become the longest war in American history. It was fought largely by young men, described by one journalist as rock and rollers with one foot in the grave. But in the autumn of 1963, very few Americans were paying attention to Vietnam. There was so much to feel good about at home. The country had never been more prosperous. People were looking towards a bright future. At this point, they trusted their leaders to solve the problems elsewhere. World peace, like community peace, does not require that each man love his neighbor. It requires only that they live together in mutual tolerance. In June of 1963, in a speech the president gave at American University in Washington, it seemed that maybe even the anxieties of the Cold War could be dispelled. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements. Khrushchev and Kennedy had both convinced the world that they were real tough guys, uh, and they wouldn't back down. That's exactly the time that people then sit and negotiate out their problems. Both men understood that, and Kennedy laid that out. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. Two months after that speech, the U.S. and Soviet Union agreed to the first comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. Dean Acheson said once that the office kind of confers a nobility on the man. And during Kennedy's tenure in office, uh, we had a very exalted sense of a president our young emperor, you know. In the summer of 1963, John F. Kennedy's political and personal ratings were the highest of his presidency. Because he was the first young president, he was a towering cultural figure. I mean, the pictures of him walking around with his little kids and whatnot, had enormous impact. It made us feel 10 feet high. We thought that we were invulnerable. It did seem as though everything came unpinned. I was sitting in a dental chair when the, the first bulletin came over, but then the bulletins became increasingly serious, so that within an hour, about the time I was out of the chair, yeah, Jack Kennedy was dead. So I dictated my story that day. And this was such an unexpected, uh, unbelievable thing that had happened. It was terribly emotional. No Americans living at that time had ever witnessed anything like this, the assassination of a president. I mean, that, that assassin's bullet killed something else. The feeling of if you're exalted, you're invulnerable. All of a sudden, you know, even this guy is vulnerable, for God's sake. 
many, many Americans. Uh, you no, know, we had our differences, uh, but I felt we had lost a friend. We had lost uh, a leader. It was such a source of inspiration. How did we make it? How did we survive? Where did we go from here? With the death of Kennedy, the end of the feeling of uh, progress was never going to end. The innocence, the, uh, uh, everything coming, everything, the reality, a slap in the face, a national car crash. I think some of the self-confidence of America died that day. Some of the optimism of America died that day. Walking up Connecticut Avenue to the church, and you look at the people who were watching us walk up the street, and there was absolute incredulity on the face of every living person. You get their eyes and your eyes, and what they were looking at you for was hopefully to get some expression from your face, from your eyes, that would help them to understand what had happened and why. And nobody understood it. For an already shaken America, there were yet more crises ahead. We'll see that on the next episode of The Century, America's Time. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us.